Good morning and welcome to Houston Baptist Church Online. We're going to show you a recording of last week's sermon and if you would like to join in with us in person you're very welcome to come along. We meet every Sunday at 10.30 and if you'd like to see some more details about that please check our Facebook page or get in contact um, using the details on the Facebook page and we'll give you all the directions you need to come along at 10.30 on a Sunday morning. But for now, I'm going to pray and then we're going to show you last week's service. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we are able to watch this at home this morning. Maybe we're not feeling great or maybe we can't get along to church for some reason. Uh, but for whatever reason that we're at home, we ask that although this is recorded, the things that are said would be helpful and encouraging and that you would speak to our hearts about you and what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Let's just pray briefly. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word as we are about to read it. Uh, we know that sometimes the word that we have is not easy <coughs> always to understand. And we pray that you will help us this morning, those who've been on the pathway a long time, and those who would admit they barely started. But Lord, we pray that your spirit would speak as you will each and every one of us in doubtless in different ways mm. because we do pray these things in Jesus name Amen. Amen. well our passage we're continuing with Luke of course is uh, Luke chapter 17 and verses 1 to 10 Luke 17 1 to 10 is Jesus of course and he said to his disciples temptations to sin are sure to come but woe to the one through whom they come it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he, that he should cause one of these little ones to sin pay attention to yourselves if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. <coughs> the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. When any of you who has a servant ploughing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did not ask the Lord? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. Mm. We have only done what was our duty. Our passage this morning seems to fall into three sections. Verses 1 to 4, first of all, verses 5 and 6, and finally verses 7 to 10. Now we're going to spend most of our time on verses 1 to 4, um, but when we get to work with that, don't worry and think you'll be here until 3 o'clock because you won't be because you're not spending all that much time on the, or less time on the, on the following two sections. Now, some people feel there's no discernible connection between the three sections. Um, rather like my garage at home, a collection of potentially useful items seemingly thrown together mm. in no apparent order. But I don't think, you know, that Luke works that way. You may remember that in our very first sermon on Luke, Luke chapter 1 and verse 3, Luke writes, I decided to write an orderly account. Mm. So this is not my garage. This is not my garage. 
Anyway, I'm giving us an overall heading this morning, and I'm borrowing that heading from the NIV. And it's simply this, three words, or four words if you like. Um, sin, faith, and duty. Sin, faith, and duty. Mm. And enlarging on the headings as we go, if you like, I'm going to call the sections Temptations to Sin, verses 1 to 4, of course. A plea for more faith, verses 5 and 6, and doing our duty, verses 7 to 10. So it's temptations to sin, 1 to 4, a plea for more faith, 5 and 6, and doing our duty, 7 to 10. So temptations to sin. We come into this passage, don't we, if you like, raw from the end of chapter 16. The disturbing story of the rich man and Lazarus. A disturbingly graphic story of the reality of eternity, where we are reminded that there is, to use an old expression, a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. Mm. And what landed the rich man in hell, do you remember? Answer, his unrepented sin. And specifically highlighted, it was his love of himself at the expense of others who were in need. And the extreme seriousness of sin is obvious in that story. And it's with that background now that Jesus addresses his own disciples on the subject of temptations to sin. Perhaps someone might think, perhaps there's some way I could live. Perhaps there's somewhere I could go. A desert island, outer space, or a secluded monastery perhaps, where I could avoid sin altogether. But no, even if you went to those places, they would have their own temptations, wouldn't they? But no, Jesus comes right out and says it. He prophesies it. Temptations to sin are sure to come. Temptations to sin are sure to come. As long as we are still here in this fallen world. Now I'm afraid I'll have to tell you that Satan is an expert tempter. He is also an expert designer and customizer, if you like, of temptations. They're all essentially the same thing, but he takes the trouble to craft them to attract us as individuals. No two of us are the same, are we? No two of us will be led astray by exactly the same things. Take the rich man, just to home in on it a moment, take the rich man's temptation, which is highlighted in chapter 16, his greed his undue preoccupation with the good things, in inverted commas, of this life. Using this, Satan has so much to work on, doesn't he, in our modern world. Now, just to give an example, I like my iPhone. It's so useful to me in a hundred different ways. But to be honest, it's only the most basic one, and I'm perfectly happy with it. Yet you, on the other hand, might be tempted to spend more money than you should on always needing to have the latest high-spec version when you've really got no reason to have it or need it. On the other hand, and this is uh, I'm letting you into a secret here, I'm sure you won't tell anybody outside, but one of my potential weaknesses at the moment is, wait for it, tools. <laughs> yes, that's right. Tools of all things. Screwfix, tool station, Axminster tools, and so on. My gosh, have you seen their websites? They're just, they're, they're just, just lovely, aren't they? But I really have to control myself. I really have to ask myself, do I need this? Will I really speed up the job and make it better? Will it be useful in the future, or will it get used for 10 minutes and then be something else in that garage I've already referred to this morning? And so we could go on. Houses, cars, bikes, food and drink, clothes, holidays, hobbies, sports equipment, music equipment, tech, 
and I've only just begun to scratch the surface, all potentially good in their, in their own way, good servants, but very bad masters. Very bad masters. Back in chapter 12 and verse 15, Jesus says, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And we've only looked at one type of sin we can be tempted into, haven't we? Time does not allow us to go into other categories of sin. All facets of idolatry in their own way. Wanting to live our way, not God's way. Wanting to worship ourselves rather than worship God. How about, for instance, and these are just examples, temptations to pride, <coughs> anger, lust, laziness, rebelliousness against parents. And so we could go on and on. Mm -hmm. Satan has thoroughly modern, expertly designed, customised versions of all of these temptations ready to use against you and against me. It sounds thoroughly depressing, doesn't it? What hope do we stand against such a determined, expert enemy? Well, always remember, always remember, our loving God is greater than the enemy, isn't he? He's greater than the enemy. Satan is a defeated foe, defeated once for all in the death and resurrection of our loving Saviour, Jesus Christ. What we are experiencing are only Satan's death throes, aren't they? He is not the victor. Jesus Christ is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 to 15, the Apostle writes, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Now, if I go on a course somewhere, to some large hotel, at the start of the day, one of the lecturers will do what they call the housekeeping, won't they? And that's telling us where the toilets are and which um, dining room the lunch is going to be served in. That's very important. But most importantly, in reality, they tell you where the fire escapes are, don't they? Where the fire escapes are. And usually they must, right there, they must have signs over them, don't they? The fire escapes. Um, they are extremely rare, thankfully, but fires in hotels do happen. But we are told where the fire escapes are. <coughs> and this is what Paul's doing for us in these verses, isn't it? He's telling us that falling, in, falling into Satan's trap, yet again, is not inevitable. It's not inevitable. It doesn't have to happen. Our God is greater than the enemy. Verse 13. He is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. He has installed fire escapes in advance so you can be okay. You can do it. Verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. If you feel you might appreciate some help confidentially in finding your own escape route from temptation, then please feel free to contact Alan, another elder, uh, or another Christian you trust. But these things are crucial for the Christian life, aren't they? Well, Brian, you say you've covered half a sentence out of ten verses, but we have done some vital groundwork, haven't we, hopefully? Because, but there's more to this, and if anything, it gets even more serious as it goes on. 
Jesus doesn't just say temptations to sin are sure to come. He completes his sentence with, um, but woe to the one through whom they come. Woe to the one through whom they come. Now as the poet John Donne famously wrote, no man is an island entire of itself. None of us lives entirely to ourselves, do we? What we do and say as Christians can directly affect others for good or for bad. I'm not breaking new ground, am I, when I say that, and particularly in this context, we can cause others to sin or cause others to disrespect the faith and see no reason why they should explore the truth and come to faith themselves. If that's how Christians are, some people say, or at least think, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want anything to do with it. So please, what effect are you having? What effect am I having on others? What about the people you work with or work for? The neighbour over your fence, your own wife, husband, children, parents. Are you bringing them nearer to Jesus Christ or are you driving them away? <laughs> Do you know, God himself could not view this more seriously. To someone who brings temptation to another, Jesus says in verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Now, a millstone, of course, is an extremely heavy piece of prepared stone used to mill corn just through its own weight. Now, in Jesus' example, you can forget being a strong swimmer. With that around your neck, you would surely drown. Now, what a picture that is, isn't it, of the seriousness of causing someone else to sin. Jesus, with his heart of love, is deeply concerned about the little ones, as he describes them. Of course, little ones in age has been especially impressionable and vulnerable. Children and young people can be deeply affected. I'm not telling you anything new, am I? They can be deeply affected by you and by me. What we do, what we say, and our attitudes. But also little ones in our senses. People who are impressionable and vulnerable spiritually for whatever reason. Perhaps they're new Christians, or people still seeking the truth, or simply people with a more sensitive personality. We're all different, aren't we? None of us are the same. Church leaders in particular, but also all other Christians, shouldn't be a snare to people. We should be shepherds to them, shouldn't we? No wonder Jesus says in verse 3, Pay attention to yourselves. Look in the mirror, says Jesus. Pay attention to yourselves. Sometimes we just need to wake up, don't we? Sometimes we do. You know, I'm reminded of Peter. When he denied Jesus at the time of his trial, he made such proud boasts, didn't he, of how loyal he was going to be to Jesus, and he would never deserve Jesus, only to fail so, so badly. He was such a disappointment to, to Jesus himself, wasn't he? But he was also such a bad example to others and a snare to them, I'm sure. But great news, great news. In God's mercy, there was a way back for Peter, wasn't there? Jesus forgave him and reinstated him. Do you remember the incident in John 21, verse 15? Um, Jesus, it's the, there's a miraculous catch of fish, if you remember, and Jesus has prepared breakfast for the um, disciples. And verse 15 says, When they have finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. And back in our passage in Luke 17, you could say there's some shepherding to be done, isn't there? Mm. And a godly example to be set right here, mm. excuse me, in the second half of verses 3 and 4. If your brother sins, says Jesus, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Amen. So not only, says Jesus, is it wrong to be the cause of another person's sin, it's also wrong to be unforgiving when a Christian sins against you. Mm. More specifically, we are to rebuke them first, and there are two extreme examples to be avoided, I think, with rebuking, uh, confronting people um, with their sin. The first is that we ignore doing it altogether, either because it's too embarrassing or too inconvenient, or because we fear we'll get a hostile response, or because we secretly think to ourselves, just let him or her stew in their own juice. It's only what they deserve, after all. Well, needless to say, none of those is a proper Christian attitude, is it? It's not showing love to our Christian brother or sister. But the second extreme over there is the exact opposite, isn't it? It's being too keen to pick up others on their faults. Being too um, keen to see small faults in others and being blissfully unaware of our own major faults. As Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or perhaps we are harsh and unloving in our approach. Paul this time, he says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. In actual fact, this is difficult work. It's sensitive work. It has to be done in a spirit of prayer, looking always to the good of the person being rebuked. Paul again, Galatians, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. The object in mind at all times um, is to be the repentance of the individual and their restoration. And we are to be prepared to repeat this process again and again if necessary. And if we perceive true repentance by forgiving Seven times, Jesus is giving the picture of going on forgiving, isn't he, for as long as it takes. He doesn't mean you forgive seven times, and then when he sins the eighth time, you can have him by the throat, does he? That's not what Jesus is saying at all. On another occasion, on a similar subject, Peter asks Jesus whether seven times is enough, and Jesus replies that it should be seventy times seven, doesn't it? You can read that in Matthew 18, 21 onwards. But you know, being truly forgiven in these types of circumstances can be so hard, can't it? Really renouncing the matter in your heart, not mulling it over or repeatedly harping back to it all the time. But as an encouragement, we are to remember how much God forgave us Father, through the death and resurrection of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and how much he continues to forgive us without hesitation when we daily pray and bring our confession to him in repentance. 
We also have countless examples down the centuries of Christians showing amazing forgiveness in situations beyond what we are ever likely to be asked to encounter. Just one example. On the 8th of November 1987, an unassuming Christian man called Gordon Wilson went to a Remembrance Day service with his young daughter. This was in Enniskillen, County Fontana, in Northern Ireland. That was the day that the IRA exploded a bomb and cut the town's war memorial. Gordon himself was injured, but his daughter was killed. In total, 11 people were killed that day, and 63 were injured. Before the day was out, the, out, the world's media was full of the horror of the atrocity, but also filled by the words of forgiveness of Gordon, who, for those who stole his daughter from him. But the story of Gordon Wilson from that point on is a fascinating one, and you can read it online if you like. Arguably, his words that day and his subsequent efforts played a significant part in the ending of the Northern Ireland Troubles. Well, that's point one. Points two and three, as I promised you at the start, will be more brief. Point two, a plea for more faith, verses five and six. This all takes grace and strength, which we don't naturally possess, doesn't it? It requires strength for the above, as we admit. Sensing that they're not equal to these things, in verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Increase our faith. Jesus, interestingly, does not answer, Yes, okay, I'll increase your faith for you. Particularly as you are going to be the founders of my church, you're going to need a lot of faith. I'm going to increase your faith. You're going to need huge faith. He doesn't even say that there are techniques for increasing faith. He doesn't say, well, actually, these are the things you need to be doing to grow your faith. No, what he does say is, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Excuse me. He's emphasising what small faith can do in God's hands. He's not saying literally that we will be doing fantastic magic tricks with mulberry trees. No. This is first century Jewish pictorial language, isn't it? The point is to emphasise the great difference in scale between a small seed and a very large tree. And this is such a comfort to us with our small faith, isn't it? Do you know, I honestly feel sometimes that my faith is, is not so much a mustard seed, it's something so small you need a microscope to see it sometimes. It seems so small and so irrelevant in the scale of what needs to be done for God's kingdom. But Jesus is saying, forget worrying about the size of your faith. Start exercising it for God's glory. Start using your mustard seed faith to fight temptation, for instance, in this passage. Start using your mustard seed faith to practice forgiveness in the way that Jesus describes here. And you will be amazed. You will be bewildered at times even by what God can do with your little mustard seed sized faith. And finally, our third point, our third point, doing our duty, verses 7 to 10. Jesus has been talking about various things, hasn't he, so far in chapter 17, things we should be busying ourselves with as key components of a healthy, functioning Christian life. But now he tells a parable 
a story of a servant and a master. Now, I don't suppose, I could be wrong, but I don't suppose um, that anybody here has a full-time servant. Um, our servants tend to be more of the mechanical type, don't they? Vacuum cleaners, automatic washing machines, and things like that. But in the time of Jesus, people would have had servants. And by the way, Jesus tells a story, it looks as if some of his disciples may have done. He says this, doesn't he? He says, will any of you who has a servant, as if he knows that certain of them do have servants. And he begins his story. Now, people of moderate means in those days, as opposed to extremely wealthy people, may have had just one servant, as seems to be the case here, who had to turn their hands to everything and certainly earned their money at the end of the week or whenever it was, when the day, whenever they got it. In the story, this poor servant is doing farm work through the day, isn't he? And then when the day's work is over, he has to come in and prepare the dinner. And after that, he has to change into smart clothes, seemingly, and play the role of the waiter and serve the dinner for his master. And only after that, when the master is completely finished, can the servant collapse into the corner of the kitchen and eat his own dinner. As I said, he certainly earned his money, didn't he, this man, in the store. Verse 7, he doesn't get invited to eat with the master. Plus verse 9, he doesn't even get a word of thanks either, does he? These days, he probably decided had enough. He would do better by going and working Tesco's or something like that, wouldn't he? But what's the point of the story? What's the point of the story? The point I believe that we should be honing in on to is the attitude of the servant to all of this. It's quite plain that's what it's about. As Christians, we can often, can't we, identify with this servant because the Christian life is not easy. It is a most wonderful life, but it is not easy. As I said in the previous sermon, be careful what you sign up for. Be careful what you sign up for. And often, let's be honest, there seems to be no end to the struggle, does there? Even in today's context, with God's help, you fight temptation today, then you wake up tomorrow and you start fighting temptation all over again. You work at forgiving your fellow Christian, and then tomorrow you have to do it all over again. And sometimes there's only insight, lack of gratitude, and things like that, isn't there? Certainly no evidence of thanks or anything like that. So what should our attitude be to this then? Jesus says it should be to say to ourselves, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what is our duty. We are unworthy servants, we have only done what is our duty. It's not like much really, does it? Why is it like that? Well, basically two reasons I think. Number one, and please, in our modern world, don't miss this one. First, we have to understand that God is God. He is the God of the universe. He created us. Why? We don't really know, but for his own pleasure. Contrary to the attitude of many modern people, we did not create God for our own comfort and convenience. But secondly, not only did God create us, he saved us, didn't he? He saved us. Amazingly, when we, the creations, who have received nothing but good from our Creator, when we rebelled against him, what did he do? Not destroy us, but he sent his only son to live and to die, to buy us back again. So like the prodigal son we considered back in Luke 15, practicing his speech on the way back home to his father's house. We say, treat me as one of your hired servants. See the parallel with our verse 10. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. 
But having said that, having said all that, and it's all true, we have to be careful how we treat parables, don't we? As we have said so often, the lesson here is our attitude as servants of God. We are to be like the servant in this story, but, but, God is not like the master. God is not like the master. Because amazingly, it doesn't end there. This story is not the whole picture. Um, he is, our master is not the master of the story. He is the father of the Luke 15 story, isn't he? The father does not wait to hear the son's practiced speech, does he, about being a hired servant. No, he bestows him with all the blessings, doesn't he, of a restored son. And whatever the Christian life may feel like to us here, our master, who we serve because it is our duty, is also our father, isn't he? Who has a great welcoming banquet ready for us in heaven when we get home. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that what you've seen and heard today is of some help to you. If you would like uh, some more help, you would like somebody to talk to or to pray with, you can get in contact with us. Please go over to our Facebook page and you'll find all the details you need there to message us on Facebook or email or give us a ring. Uh, please feel free to do that. And remember, you're always welcome to join with us on a Sunday morning in person as well. So we hope you're gonna have a great week. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna say goodbye. Thank you for the things that we've heard this morning. For everyone watching, and I pray that you would help them in whatever needs they may have right now. Please look after them as they step out into a new week and everything that they're gonna to have to do or all the expectations or concerns that they have, please walk with them and guide them and be their wisdom and strength. We pray also that uh, for each one of us, we would know that there is an eternal hope, that because of what Jesus has done for us, that through faith in him, we can be justified by faith. We can be counted as righteous as him. We can be counted as if we had never done anything wrong and be in fellowship and friendship with you right now and forever. So please help us to take that hope to heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us and we'll see you again next time.